morning. Uh, there are 35 of us signed on this morning. So thank you for being here and being a part of our presentation. Um, let's talk a little bit about Kihi. I know not everybody is familiar. This is, uh, if this organization is new to you, uh, it was established back in 1995, back in the Back in the 1900s, that's what my kids say, when uh, uh, Christian institutions were still trying to figure out adult higher education. If you think about those days, it was still a novelty. It was uncharted territory. But today we recognize that the ad adult learners are the emerging primary market for uh, higher education, for graduate programs, and for continued learning. Last year's conference, uh, we, fo we formed some learning communities around different topics in order to facilitate ongoing collaboration um, and to develop some topics for research. Uh, we, one of the com learning communities that we formed was on the topic of teaching and learning, and we've been engaged with that so uh, throughout the year. Um, these, uh, the topics that we're looking at today is actually comes from that learning community. Let me encourage you guys, we were, as Renee was saying earlier, we were gonna have a conference. It would have been scheduled for this week. So in place of that, the Kihia leadership has uh, scheduled a week of webinars. So there will be different groups pre presenting. Um, you can find out more information about that uh, at the Facebook page, probably the best place to look. But we will be having tomorrow, we will be having a uh, session with our teaching and learning community. And uh, in that session, we're gonna be looking over the research needs and questions we're gonna discuss the conference schedule that's planned for this October, uh, and uh, given all the changes and the disruptions that have happened in higher education, it's gonna give us a chance to kind of look at that and make some decisions about maybe what needs to be adjusted or changed. But if you attend our, our research summit tomorrow, you're gonna get a chance to dialogue with some teaching and learning colleagues from other Christian institutions, and you're gonna come away with some, probably some great ideas for research uh, or presentations that maybe you can contribute. So let me encourage you to be a part of that. Best way you can uh, connect with that is uh, go to the Facebook page, search for Christian Adult Higher Education Association, or go to facebook.com slash Kahia with the number one at the end of it, number one, and then you will find uh, all the information you need to be able to register for tomorrow's session. Renee's also put the link in the chat so you guys can refer to that uh, and use the link there to connect. My name is Mark Fabian. I have been leading this uh, teaching and learning community for Kahia for the last year. Uh, if you need to reach out to me, I've provided my email address there. I'm part of Evangel University right here in Springfield, Missouri. I see some of my colleagues and other professors on here. So welcome to you guys. Thank you for being a part of this. We are gonna start with a, uh, a quick poll for you guys. So let me pull up this here and launch the poll to you. We want to get just a quick profile of the folks who are a part of the session today. What roles are you involved with at your institution? And you can select all that apply to this. Are you teaching, instructional design, student support, academic leadership? Uh, many of us <laughs> probably wear many of those hats. So go ahead and check the boxes there uh, and we'll, we'll get a sense of the profile of the people who are part of the conference today. We've got almost 90%, 90% have responded. We'll wait just a moment more in case you're checking a bunch of those boxes. Wow, you guys are a good class. Like everybody, <laughs> everybody responded to the poll. This is great. Let me, uh, let me end that and switch over and uh, share the results to you guys. And you can see that we got a lot of teachers with us today, 76%, 30% uh, um, uh, do some instructional design, academic leadership and uh, faculty support and professional development, 45% of you guys, great. Uh, some enrollment people and a few others in there. So thank you for indicating your roles with us. All right. 
So let me give you the agenda for our session today. This is going to be a uh, panel discussion where we're gonna hear from some different folks who have been teaching and, and supporting faculty through the pandemic. So what I'm gonna do is first introduce our panelists and then um, we've got some focused questions for our panelists to be able to share their perspectives on teaching and learning through the pandemic. And then at the end here, we've saved some time for audience Q&A. So let me encourage you, if you have questions, comments, insights, observations that you wanna share with the group, you can put those in the chat or you can just hold on to them till we get to that point in the uh, webinar. Um, we have, let's see, 36 of us on the call. So uh, at that point, even if you needed to unmute and share your question, or again, if you just wanna put it in the chat, that's fine, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll come back to all the questions later in the session. So let's meet our panelists. We've got three great people with us today. First is Dr. Breck Harris. He is a professor of business uh, at Fresno, uh, Fresno Pacific University. We have Dr. Emily Johns. She's the instructional designer at Evangel University. She works with me. And Mr. Phil Brown. He is an instructional designer with Moody. And so we are glad that they are with us. Uh, I actually got a text from Phil saying he was having some internet issues. So hopefully he is able to get on and participate in the panel. But uh, we're going to start again with some just some focused questions. So Breck, let me spotlight your video. And uh, we'll start with some questions for you, sir. Uh, first of all, Breck, how did you feel? Uh, you, you are a, a faculty person. You were teaching face-to-face -face courses. So how did you feel when you were told that you needed to move all your courses to online? Well, uh, you know, I, I teach, uh, well, this last semester I taught um, at two different universities. So I think my shock was uh, increased even more when both institutions uh, informed me that uh, I needed to make a transition immediately, basically within a week, in all my courses um, to an online or remote learning environment. So I'd say my, my initial feelings were a high degree of shock and anxiety, worry and stress. Uh, I'm not necessarily very strong in the online environment, so that kind of increased the feelings of tension. Yeah, for sure. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how your role changed? Well, you know, there, I'd say it, it was pretty significant. Um, it was, first of all, I, I realized almost intuitively, I guess, that I needed to have a kind of a, a strong um, attitude towards um, accepting change and uh, embracing it. And so, uh, it, it was a pretty dramatic shift um, in, in my teaching. It affected, um, I had a total of actually six courses at two different institutions. So uh, I instantly had to make transitions in my syllabus, in my curriculum, in my way of d delivery, uh, of learning new um, platforms in Canvas and Moodle. I had two different platforms to learn how to transition, how I was going to make... Uh, an online or remote learning environment work for my courses. So uh, it was a pretty dramatic shift. Um, I found myself working 18 hour days for a mini, truthfully for probably several weeks afterwards as, as, as I was absorbing and learning and, uh, on, and making constant changes literally by an hourly basis to uh, my courses and, and finding out also the important need to communicate these changes quickly uh, to my students so that they were aware of how the course was changing and learning to be flexible too uh, to these changes. Um, I'd say it was, it was diff difficult for me to suddenly face too when I started working with synchronous formats. That's how I chose to work with my students. They met at the same time, the same place, synchronously, meaning we, we met at the same time periods, but we were meeting through Zoom. and. Uh, it was different for me to not have the energy of having the, the interaction between myself physically and my students and then suddenly looking at a screen with 40 uh, maybe names, uh, black screens with just their names on it and finding that there was a different energy shift uh, that I needed to make as a teacher because I didn't have that 
you know, I was used to working a room and, 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 and walking the room and, and making contact with my students. I didn't have that anymore. So that was a big change for me. Yeah. So share with us a little bit, Breck, about what you learned from the experience. Well, you know, I, I'd say the big thing that I learned was, first of all, having control over my own mental attitude towards change. And I think that's really important um, to reflect on, that uh, I was either, either going to allow this to kind of overwhelm me. And uh, I, I, I teach at another institution called Fresno State, um, a, a large institution there. And I was hearing reports through their center of faculty um, experts that a lot of the teachers at that university were experiencing a high degree of anxiety, of uh, stress, of uh, being overwhelmed. And so, um, you know, I think I was served well by my own faith walk, you know, praying to God and saying, look, I'm going to need some help here. And that helped me a lot to, uh, to, to adjust to it and embrace what I call embrace the change. Yeah. And positive attitude towards it. I also found that um, I needed to shift more with my students at both institutions more to a counseling role. Uh, the students I was working with, I, I could see that <clears throat> they were experiencing a high level of stress themselves. And uh, I found myself um, realizing the important role of being more of a counselor and, um, and you know, encouraging them as I was able to tell them we're going to get through this and and uh, I found my meetings always ending with kind of an encouraging note with the students and trying to check in with them, see how they were feeling. Mm -hmm. Many of them were also over, overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, so opening good channels of communication with students is really important. So I gave all my students at both institutions my personal phone number. I, I often never have done that before, but I, I kind of felt intuitively I wanted to break through the online remote um, barrier between myself and my students since I couldn't be with them face to face and really invite them to contact me any hour of the day if they needed me. And I did find that was very effective to help some of the students with their anxiety. Hmm. What, uh, what tools did you find to effectively engage learners through, throughout the disruption? Well, you know, I didn't know Zoom at all. I'd never had a Zoom meeting. And, uh, <laughs> uh, Zoom was a very powerful tool. One mm -hmm. of my colleagues, Michelle Bradford, uh, was very kind to work with me quite a bit with Zoom. I had a lot of meetings with her, and she was very experienced in it. So her, uh, her, her contact was, um, and assistance was, was very helpful. Also, at both institutions, they had excellent centers for um, online teaching support. Mm -hmm. And um, both institutions made available eight to five uh, Zoom meetings to allow any of us to interact with them. And that kind of communication was absolutely uh, critical mm -hmm. and uh, helped my anxiety reduce a lot, knowing that I, I could always go at any time as I was making these transitions to experts who were there to um, help me. So... Um, I found too, uh, learning, I, I found going synchronistically with my students at the same time they were used to, um, that seemed to work for me well. Even though I probably recommend um, that I didn't do this, I might next semester, uh, record some of your lectures that you have synchronistically and make them available for students that ha can't join you so they can watch your lectures later asynchronously. Mm. I, I probably recommend recommend. And you know, one other thing I found in this experience, um, I had written and published before in the area of flipped classroom design. Right. And I found that actually a strength of this whole process was uh, flipping some of the assignments around, putting, putting them in an online environment, the students read them, they do it, and then they come into the Zoom meetings ready to discuss them was, was a more effective use of teaching. So Breck, you mentioned the uh the different centers at the institutions. Um, yes. what, what other resources, or can you tell us a little bit more about the resources you engaged that you found helpful to support you through it? Well, uh, you know, when I think about um, Zoom itself as a as an online technological tool, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that really helped me break through the um, the the barrier, what I call the barrier that we experience between teacher and students in in online teaching, 
was uh, the breakout room format. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend it for those of you that are going to be using Zoom. Uh, I found it very powerful as a way to quickly break groups into uh, smaller groups on subjects that you want them to discuss, uh, cases, and then I could actually join each of those rooms uh, separately and interact with the students in those rooms and then bring them back out of those rooms for a large class discussion. Uh, many of the students commented later that they they enjoyed that, that interaction experience. So that was a, a very important resource within um, Zoom itself. Did you, uh, one of the questions that came from our attendees here, did, does uh, your, the Moodle, where you're using Moodle, did it inclu include collaborate? You know, it, 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 um, it probably did, but <laughs> again, <laughs> I'm the most experienced uh, person in, in any of these online modalities. Um, and uh, I, I, I didn't, I, I'm not aware of that. It might okay. be. Okay. Yeah. I'm aware of that. Excellent. Well, we're going to transition over here to uh, Dr. Emily Johns. Let me spotlight her video now. Hi, Emily. Hi, Mark. Uh, as an instructional designer, she, she works at Evangel University with me, but uh, so Emily, as an instructional designer, you're responsible for supporting full-time and adjunct professors. How did you feel when you heard about this need to move all of our face-to-face -face courses to promote or online? Uh, there were probably three distinct feelings that I felt. The first one was I was fearful. Um, knowing that there were many faculty who just weren't prepared for this. Uh, because of what I do, I knew that they didn't know what they didn't know, and I was actually afraid for them. But as with many small institutions in the U.S. right now, we're, you know, we're all working on a razor's edge, and faculty loads have increased. These, these increased loads were going to make that flip to online and remote in a matter of less than two weeks, it was gonna be a Herculean task. So I was, I was really fearful for them. The second feeling I had was that um, I was very anxious. Uh, how can I help them? I, I'm, a, I'm a number two on the Enneagram. I've got helper genes everywhere. And that was my, one of my first thoughts was, wow, how in the world am I gonna help all these people? I'm the only, instructional designer on campus and our office, our digital learning office is just three of us. So I wasn't quite sure how that was going to happen. In our case, we just kind of began to talk amongst ourselves. Um, ironically, we were scheduled to go to Missouri S&T and Rolla for a conference. And um, I don't know, Mark and Tamara, if you remember, it was it, the theme of the conference was the future of online learning. And that was scheduled for March 12th. And I thought, man, are we going to get a crash course in this? <laughs> um, we, we had a couple of weeks uh, before that that I'd been feeling a bit edgy. I'm not a risk taker. And I was feeling edgy about even going to the conference uh, because I knew that Kansas City and St. Louis uh, had had spikes in their infections. And I knew that this conference was going to pull in a lot of teachers from all over the state. So... I was a little nervous and I, Tamara and I would talk, Mark, you know, was in uh, upper level meetings where they were starting to talk, but Tamara and I had some real heart to hearts uh, in my office and we were like, what in the world are we going to do if this happens? I mean, we were, we were a bit anxious, but both of us are can do people. So we jumped in and she started uh, investigating the major universities, particularly New York State and realized that they were already beginning to implement online classes at that point. And so at that point, we just said, that's it. We have to start moving on this. And so in our anxiousness, we just kicked into gear. And then Mark joined us and we just all, every day it was back and forth, back and forth all day long. And really miraculously within a little over a week, we had developed a continuance plan and published it on the website called Talk, Plan, and Teach. And uh, it was just, a, it was a great tool for our faculty to have. We, we got it out there, we let them know. So that relieved some of my anxiousness. Now, don't, don't judge me by this last statement. My last emotion uh, that I felt uh, when I heard that this was gonna happen was that I was happy. I was giddy happy 
because after years of trying to steer the faculty towards LMS usage and the development of online courses, they were now mine. <laughs> I knew they would come and want want help. help. So it was funny. It had always been this big tug of war between the faculty and the digital learning office. And we'd go back and forth and back and forth. But in an unforeseen consequence of this horrible virus, the faculty had been shoved through the door and they were ours. The fat lady had sung. <laughs> and deep in my soul, I sensed that the face of higher education at our institution would be forever changed. <laughs> And I was so grateful and happy for that. So those were my wow. three emotions, fearful, anxious, and happy. Uh, and I resonate with that. They said it couldn't be done. <laughs> <laughs> and, it and here was. we are. Yes. Yeah. So um, get back to the next one. What, uh, and working in your work with the faculty, um, supporting uh, almost 200 faculty working on sets, about over 700 courses. What, from your experience, what were the most significant needs that you encountered among the faculty that you support? Oh, there were several. I think the first one was um, th this faculty, they were, it was like a war zone, quite honestly. You know, you, there, there weren't guns going off and bombs going off, but when you have four to six classes with 50 to 60 students each, you know, these are your big uh, core classes that everybody has to take. And you've got to flip those to online in a matter of a couple of weeks. It was crazy. I mean, in many cases, I wound up as a chief encourager, counselor, pastor, listening ear, facilitator, talker off the ledge person. It was just... <laughs> It was, you know, they were, they were coming into the office, they were calling, they all had my phone number. And so I'm sure they were calling you and Tamara as well, just calling and like, I can't do this. I don't know what to do. And so you just had to help them calm down and, and, and get their focus again. And off we went. Um, now, part of the, part of what I saw was uh, we had a good number of faculty that were pretty proficient in uh, using the LMS and in leading their classes in a type of a blended uh, class environment. They used the, the system very well, but they were also, you know, face to face. And that worked for them. And really that crew needed minimal assistance to get their courses fully online. They just needed a little encouragement and a attaboy type stuff and a few ideas and off they went. On the other hand, we had a number of faculty that needed technical assistance, a lot of technical assistance in using the LMS because they had never done anything in the system before. And this included things as simple as setting up a basic assignment, setting up a quiz, a video lecture, a discussion board, even processing their grades became a challenge because they had never really used the grading book. So, because they didn't want to. So, and that had been allowed, so you just let them do it, and um, we had to deal with that. I think uh, in our case, and I think in the case of many universities, there were a couple of progressive faculty who immediately moved to Zoom. And in that vacuum that was created by the crisis, there were a good number of faculty who just followed. They just blindly followed because they weren't hearing anything else as such. And, you know, Zoom was really the, the path of least resistance if you were used to a lecture-based style of teaching. And even more attractive was that Zoom was very easy to use. And so they just jumped on the bandwagon thinking that was the solution because to have to turn around and learn the system in two, in two weeks was just, they couldn't even go there. Um, honestly, I worried about this for three reasons. It, it placed the Zoom conferences, for the most part, placed students in a passive learning mode in a time when we seriously needed to engage them in conversation. They were all suffering trauma from this crisis and they needed a, a voice to help them process what was happening in the classroom, not just academically, but spiritually. But our classes, you know, our classes were the perfect place for that. But sadly, in many cases, what happened was they just continued the classroom lecture model in Zoom. 
And if you have dealt with Zoom much, it's not easy to hold a big class discussion with it because there's a lot of interruption and variance in, in uh, the speed of the internet. And so it's just complicated. Um, the second thing was it that in the early days, I noticed that students were complaining of Zoom fatigue. Um, I heard several of them say, I just can't sit through another Zoom. I, I just can't do it because they were sitting in hours of Zoom. I mean, not just one, it was like multiple hours a day in a Zoom conference. And they just said, if this is what online learning is about, I don't want any more of it. The last thing was that I noticed was that Zoom had been mistaken for online teaching when in reality, it was nothing more than an emergency remote teaching uh, solution. Uh, there's a really good article that was put out by Educause Review. It was published on March 27, entitled The Difference Between Emergency Remote Teaching and Online Learning. And if you haven't read it yet, I suggest that you do. It's Educause Review, March 27, the difference between emergency remote teaching and online learning. It's a really good article that explains the difference. Online learning is very different from the emergency remote that we saw. Mm. Lastly, the most significant need that I saw was the faculty that had barricaded themselves in the face-to-face -face teaching camp. They didn't have a clue where to begin. They were lost. For years, they had preached, I don't want to do this. Um, I want that classroom experience. I want to see their eyeballs. I want to see the light bulb moments. And they refused. They just refused. I had been one of those. Up until three years ago, I had been one of those. And so I, I empathized, but um, I just want to share a little story uh, it's the, the power, it's really powerful to share the story of one. So I want to share a story and I'll finish it a little later in my presentation. So my one was a faculty member that I tried to coax into the online camp for 18 years. Uh, I'm sorry, 18 months. He, he was not going to have any of it. He avoided me at every turn, um, would not return my calls. If he saw me in the hall, he walked the other way. Seriously, this guy wanted nothing to do with the digital learning office, and he was going to teach how he wanted to teach. So when the edict to uh, teach everything online came down, I heard that he stood up in a faculty meeting and proclaimed rather loudly, I am not going to teach online. I knew in reality that he was scared spitless. He did not know where to start, and I would have to tread very carefully in the days ahead, and I'll finish I'll finish that story a little later. But those were the, those were the things I saw. There were just different levels of, of need. Uh, there was this mass exit to Zoom for a lot of them. And I, I wanted to haul them back in and say, whoa, 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 we can do it better than that. You know, Zoom is a great tool, but, but come back just a little to the center and, and let us show you how to design some of these engaging learning uh, environments online. You can do it. So, so that's, that's what I, that's what I uh, saw. Yeah, that's really good. That distinction between emergency remote instruction and what we think of as, as a, a fully developed online learning experience. I think that's an important distinction to make. Uh, another group that's uh, done a lot of work on that is um, the University of Central Florida has a Center for Distributed Learning and they do a, a podcast called Teaching Online Podcast. And they've talked a lot about that distinction as well. Uh, I think it's something we need to make for our students too, because sometimes our, our, our students have this impression of online education now from the experience of the pandemic that yes. might be a bit askew because they haven't really experienced a well-designed online program. They've experienced remote, emergency remote instruction. So uh, some, some good tips there. Uh, Emily, one last question here for you. Um, what, what are you doing to prepare for the next academic year? Well, first of all, I wasn't sure I was gonna survive. Um, <laughs> we, when everything hit, I honestly felt like uh, Han Solo in the Millennium Falcon and he was, you know, flying against the, flying for the Rebel Alliance. And I mean, I was in my chair eight to 10 hours a day fighting those TIE fighters. It was, it was nuts. But we made it, and now as I look towards next year, I gotta tell you, I'm very excited. 
um, as an instructional designer and a small institution in a very small office, um, I troubleshoot problems in the system. I handle a lot of faculty training for course design and LMS usage, and I provide assistance in helping some faculty build and develop their courses across the campus. I love what I do, but I am, I am spread pretty thin. So as soon as the spring semester was finished, I thought, man, I've got to do something to help this faculty. So we set up an online instructor certification course, which is something we had offered multiple times in the past. It's a five week course fully online that the faculty can engage in. I put it out there because it's the easiest way to train a group of faculty and nurture excellent online course development for the future. In the past, I had had to beg people to take this course. I mean, beg. There just wasn't any interest or very little interest uh, or drive to take it. But this time, as the invitation went out, the, regi the registrations just streamed in. It was obvious that our faculty and staff were now seeing the light as far as online education and it wasn't going to go away. This is the largest cohort in that course that we've ever had. I'm teaching it right now. And the beautiful thing is that people signed up of their own free will. To me, that's the best kind of learning. It starts with the desire to learn. Um, we can tell them they have to take it and they'll do it. But if they do it themselves, if they decide that they need to learn this, the learning is going to be more impactful and long-term in range as far as what I've seen. Um, so what I'm, what I'm seeing in this class right now, I'm teaching it as we speak, is um, a tremendous amount of camaraderie uh, amongst the faculty and even the staff. I have two staff people who are taking the course. The emotion that's tied to this camaraderie enhances their learning and they are doing fabulous. Yesterday, I was going in to insert some comments into a discussion on assessments. And so I, I was a little behind, I was a day behind. And so I was reading through all of their responses. And I mean, they had jumped in there, they were talking to each other and critiquing each other. And by the time I got done, I thought, there's nothing I could say, it would all be redundant. So I just sent him a note and I said, you guys are doing so well. I'm not even going to comment in this discussion thread. You're, you know, you just did fantastic. So I'm just so impressed at what's happening. We're, as a result of this good, good feedback and response that we're getting, we're going to start another online certification course on July 8th. And even before I've sent out the invitation, I have five registrations. So I'm anxious to see what develops. The faculty that takes these courses, will be our best PR for future faculty training that's offered by the Digital Learning Office. So I take that, I take my role as their instructor very seriously. I want them to learn and enjoy the learning as they do it and feel that they have a friend now who can help them develop their online classes. Another thing I do is I continue to provide assistance to those who are calling and emailing with questions. My rule is it needs to be answered in 24 hours, 48 at the outset. And if it's 48, I send them a note that I'm working on it. I'll be back with you tomorrow. So 24 hours. That way, th when the question arises and they call for help, they know there's somebody there. I want, I want them to understand that they can get through to somebody and that they will be there to help. The second thing is I continue to build relationships with the faculty because relationship uh, provides open doors that allow me to speak into their situation that I might not get otherwise. So that's the most powerful uh, door opener. Um, I also uh, encourage them right at this point, any faculty that I'm talking to, and I am getting this question, they're saying, what should I do for the fall? Should I develop an online course? Should I develop my courses for online? And, and what I'm telling them is, why don't you do something right in the middle? Develop a bit of a hybrid where you've got everything in the system and you're still planning to meet, but you could easily flip a hybrid to an online course in a matter of a, a very short period. So you'll save yourself a little bit of anxiousness. It, you know, don't just plan on that seated class meeting as seated. You need to be planning for a flip in case COVID hits again, which it probably will. 
Um, and then, of course, I keep scanning the horizon for the latest developments in COVID. And in my mind, the digital learning office is the lighthouse that's going to keep that faculty from hitting the rocks should another crisis occur. We have our continuous plan there, but um, we're still, they still sometimes need a handhold or someone to talk to a listening ear as they wander into this new territory. Now, to close today, you remember I was talking about the story of one my faculty member who was not going to teach online, well, here's the conclusion to the story. He contacted me rather sheepishly when the crisis struck and asked for some assistance. Um, he was so lost, he really didn't even know which questions to ask. So I'd helped him as best I could, I, and, and in one last attempt to convince him that he could teach online, I told him, you know, Everybody describes you the same way when I ask them what kind of a teacher you are. And he said, well, what's that? I said, they all say that you're a dynamic lecturer. So I encouraged him to capture that dynamic lecturer on video for his online class. I think he was a bit shocked by the challenge, but um, as, I, as I came to see, it obviously rang a bell somewhere. And in all of the busyness that was going on in those last five weeks, I did not have time to check on him and I didn't hear anything from him. So my assumption was everything was okay and he was somehow hanging on. When I looked in the class at the end of the semester, he was using the basics of the LMS. Now mind you, he had never used it before. He even had his own YouTube channel, which was hosting his lectures. And when I sent out the registration link for the certification course at the end of the semester, guess who was one of the first ones to sign up? You guessed it, my one. And guess who is thriving and participating to the max in this certification course that he's in right now? You guessed it, it's my one. He's gonna make it. I think we've just about made him a believer. He actually said in a video in the class, I'm finding a lot of things that I can use with this online format. So I couldn't be prouder. And that's what we strive for is just changing the one, one at a time. We will conquer this mountain of online education. Thanks, Emily. That was excellent. Excellent. Great perspective from an instructional designer. We're going to transition to a time of questions. Some of you have already posted some questions in the Q&A. So one of the questions was uh, that uh, this is from Isaac at um, um, they, their uh, adult programs are going fully online this fall and any suggestions to pass on to their faculty members. I think a few of those have already come up, um, uh, but Emily, Breck, would you, uh, were there other suggestions that perhaps you would, you would offer? Yeah. Um I also responded to Isaac, but I'll share this with everyone. I, I, I was sharing with uh, Isaac that I thought it was so critically important that, um, uh, that his technical support people that support the LMS system uh, provide eight to five Zoom contact uh, capability. Uh, Emily gave uh, reflection to the idea that she, she found it was really important to begin developing relationships with faculty and I found myself developing a lot of real personal contacts and relationships between myself and the, um, the technical support people at two different institutions. And, and that was really helpful. I mean, that really helped calm me down. They got to know me over time because I was there all the time asking questions. So uh, eight to five Zoom contact support for all of your faculty, uh, I think is an important way of, cr of creating communication, contact, and knowledge exchange between uh, faculty who really need that information from the technically strong people at your institution. Yeah, I, th I think another thing, if you're, if you're putting your adult uh, program online, uh, make sure that you require each of those adult faculty, adjunct, fa adjunct faculty, to be trained in your system, whatever that is. Um, uh, even if it's a, just a brief tutorial, they need that training to acquaint themselves with the system. And uh, it should be done before they do anything else. Uh, we're seeing that that helps more than anything with our adult studies program. Lisa Tyson heads that up at, at Evangel. And if they're trained, the, it's amazing the difference in their classes. So um, they may have taught for years, 
but they still need training in on the, your online system, your LMS. And if I could follow up on that, what Emily shared, um, I'm taking two different online training courses um, at, at the two different institutions that are being offered this summer. And I would highly encourage all of you, uh, you know, just to give you a historical context here, I've been teaching for 25 years. Um, this event, the pandemic, has created the most profound historical change that has ever occurred, in my opinion, in the history of teaching. Teaching yeah. exchange between teachers at all different levels, between themselves and their students. Uh, the transition to remote or online learning has changed the paradigm. And Emily uh, gave reference to it. It may be, this may be a, a big future change that all of us, no matter what we think about remote or online learning, we need to embrace this change. At the very least, I've realized the importance of, of learning about putting new, uh, new insights from this form of communication, remote and online learning into your kit bag to be an excellent teacher. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and I think it, it, it helps us to be better. Exactly. That's good. Exactly. So I, I think of three things that uh, the idea of resources, developing training resources that are available for faculty, pedagogy, giving uh, teachers some information about course design. But I think maybe the one, and that would be the first two that I would go to. But the thing that I think has really come from this pandemic and from our experience is the importance of relationships, the building those relationships of, of trust and collaboration between the support, between the academic leadership, whether you're IT, digital learning, you know, whatever support structures you guys have, but building those relationships of support and openness and collaboration, because that's what, that's what really makes the difference to be able to connect and walk alongside faculty. Uh, we got another uh, question here, um, a question about support for students. We've got adult uh, learners who are in online and, and, uh, and seated programs. Uh, if they choose in seat, they're, they're not digital native, natives, and then suddenly they're thrust into an online environment. So what kind of support are you offering for students? Do you guys, can you speak to that from your experience? Yeah, Fresno State has been uh, superb at um, offering a lot of different resources available to students to help them, uh, including um, psychological training, counseling, um, and different areas of, of support for them. Uh, they've also made a lot of changes in their, um, their requirements for uh, delivery of learning to students with disabilities, hmm. um, which, which was very interesting to see how they, they transitioned so quickly to really being uh, receptive uh, to the, um, the needs of, of, of students. And uh, Fresno Pacific University, I think, is also uh, making some changes like that as well. So I'd say that's an important part of this. We don't want to forget, forget the role of the student in all this and how they've been impacted by this. In fact, if I may add to this, I found a lot of contact coming from my students to me and they were angry mm -hmm. in some of my courses about having to make the transition into an online environment. Right. And uh, they weren't happy. Many of them were not happy with it at all. So we, we've, we've as teachers have to be, I think, more receptive to the, our role as counselors. And those who work at, of course, at Christian institutions, may I add the importance of also uh, taking time out um, to pray uh, in your classroom settings for your students. I found that, I didn't mention this, but uh, prayer for your students, um, if your institution allows it, uh, is I think for us who work at Christian institutions, an integral part of how we create contact, communication, and connection between our students ourselves and and uh the lord that we serve so it's important yeah that's good exactly i think i think the adult studies program at evangel is fully online I, i'm going back to this uh she's saying that people who sign up for the in seat options are not really digital natives and what kind of support do we offer the all of our adult studies are online but one of the first classes they have to take is a introduction to computers because quite honestly, guys, the days are gone when you can enter the educational arena and not know how to use computers. For goodness sake, I used to work in unemployment and even to file for your unemployment, you had to use a computer. You had to go in there and search for jobs on a computer. Uh, the days of not using a computer are over. It's, it's infiltrated everything we do. 
So I think that introduction course, I think Tamara, my colleague, taught that once. And there's a desperate need for that because there are people out there who do not know how to use a computer. And so that course helps them get their bearings in the system and, and uh, take their courses online. Holly asked a question about uh, our online certification. So I, there are a lot of great training resources that are out there. Those of you familiar with the Online Learning Consortium, they do fantastic training. Uh, and Emily's actually gone through their instructional designer training for that. Uh, the reason we've chosen to do an, an instructor certification for our professors is so that we can demonstrate using our system, applying our values, our mission, and really showing this is what, even for those who have taught online elsewhere, we still put them through that online instructor certification so that we can help them understand this is what online education looks like for Evangel University. We're applying our, our values, our mission to it. So I would encourage you know, um, those institutions that are providing training to think about that, that they, certainly the, the uh, instructors can engage the best practices, the resources that are out there. They can go through on the online learning consortium or some other training uh, center, but you know, the training that they would get from you, however you uh, structure that, it can help them see this is what it means for us. This is what makes our classes distinct and, um, and what we would do. That being said, we're not at all opposed to some kind of collaboration. So Holly, <laughs> if we want to follow up on that, I'd be happy to talk with you. You know, this is one of the great things about the Kahia community is that it is such a collaborative community. There have been so many times when we've received and shared resources with one another, and it's been a real blessing so that we can all do better. So uh, if there are any questions uh, about that, we've used a lot of open source stuff in the construction of the certification. We refined it over the years, and uh, it's, it's, uh, Emily's doing a great job leading that at this point with our, with our professors, but we would be happy to share and, and give you a tour of that to see what we're doing and share some resources if you want to replicate something like that for your institutions. Um, uh, Frank asked a question, what does, uh, what does teaching and learning look like on the other side of this pandemic? And that will probably have to be our last question. If you guys want to offer some, as we look future perspectives here, what, what does it look like going forward, do you think? Let me, I'll start off first, Emily. Emily, you can add, you can add to this. Um, you know, I, I have been thinking a lot about this. Um, Emily mentioned the fact that we've been nationally faced to make this dramatic trans, transformational change in teaching and embracing more of the remote and online learning environment now, whether we like it or not. What will the future be? Um, you know, I, I, I think... I think that it'll be probably a mixture of the two that will probably present the best opportunities for a learning because, you know, we always need to th think about this reality. We are offering learning to students and students, I think, gain strength from face-to-face -face interaction, human interaction, along with the best elements of what I think online or remote learning offer us now. So I would, I would say to answer that question, when I look at the real future, in my opinion right now, I think it would be a, a hybrid uh, of the two. Hmm. Uh, institutions that offer opportunities for the, the Socratic traditional human exchange between a teacher and students, I still think that's going to be a critical component of excellent effective teaching. However, uh, as Emily said, <laughs> if she's found so many of these teachers kicking and fighting and now starting to embrace online learning, I think we can all be better informed by what these modalities of learning really offer us all as teachers to be excellent communicators with our students. I, I agree. I, I believe it's going to be a type of hybrid uh, with a heavy emphasis on online just because the world is so transient and we, to, to keep our market uh, relevant or to keep to keep up with our market and provide for their needs we're, we are going to have to allow for that online component I don't think the Socratic method will ever go away I think it always has value but um, I do think that the days of just uh, the luxury of, of seated courses and face-to-face -face all the time I think those days are over I think this has profoundly changed how we will do higher education in this country um, from this day forward. 
Well, thank you to Breck and Emily. And unfortunately, Phil was not able to join us. He had some inter an internet outage that happened right before the meeting. But uh, uh, this has been a great discussion. I want to thank you guys all for attending. Let me encourage you to be part of tomorrow's webinar. It's going to have kind of an open agenda where we're going to get to be able to discuss topics. Uh, you can go to the Kahia Facebook page and you'll see all of the whole week of webinars, different topics that uh, perhaps you can suggest for some of your colleagues. Uh, and some of those have been put in the chat as well, the descriptions of what's coming up this week. So let me encourage you, take advantage of those opportunities to connect with your colleagues here. You'll learn a lot from them and you'll make some great connections. I also want to highlight one more time the conference this fall, October 19 through 22 uh, in Grapevine, Texas. You can go to the Kahia website to get information about that and to register, or again, check the Facebook page and you'll be up to date on all the latest announcements. My thanks again to Breck and Emily for being our panelists. We appreciate your perspectives and thank you for sharing. Thank you for everyone who has attended. God bless you all. We will see you next time.